So our host for today, thank you for joining us. Our host today is uh, Billy Mwape. He will introduce himself. I might not uh, do justice if I, I took the honor of introducing him. He will introduce himself. And uh, today the topic that we're discussing is uh, agile in parenting. How do we translate agility into our families, into our personal lives and in, into parenting? So Billy is, um, very um, adept at that, at doing that. And he will share his experience and his story. And it's a very interesting story. So Billy, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much. I really uh, appreciate Chimunia and thanks to Agile 20 Reflective Festival organizers. And thanks to all of you who are joining us now and all of you who will be watching this video after it has been recorded. I'm indeed excited to share my story and how we've managed to incorporate or adapt the agile principles and values in raising our son with special needs. I will start by sharing just two slides. And after that, we'll jump right into a conversation as Nchimunya said, this is a conversation that we're having. It's not really a serious uh, delivery of, or presentation. So I would like you to be very engaged. Who is Billy? I love to call myself as an agile parent, and I want you to know me as such in this event. I'm a father of three now, and what led to this presentation is a situation that happened to us on the 3rd of March, 2016, when we had our firstborn son. And what happened was there was an accident during birth. He ran out of oxygen in the birth canal and he suffered brain injury. Six months down the line, he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, a brain damage that affects body movement and balance, but it's non-progressive. Having gone through this brought about a lot of ideas which could help us to ameliorate the, our son's situation. And we looked at the situation and thought to ourselves that, what if we applied some agile principles, some agile knowledge in managing the process around, around him because we were told he was never going to even sit. But after learning more about brain plasticity and how much of the brain can transform itself by having an enabling environment around it, we realized that we had a lot of hope to give to our son. And so we put together something that we call agile parenting methodology. And this is what I'm going to be discussing about. I'm a leadership trainer, project management consultant, and a keynote speaker. I'm a PMP as well as a Agile Certified Practitioner. So just jumping right into this, I don't want to take it for granted that everybody on this call knows the thing about Agile. For those of you who may not know about Agile, I just brought this little picture to give you an overview of what an Agile framework is. And when you look at this, you see the key components. You need to have a team for you to execute any tasks that you have. You need to have a product owner, somebody that will be looking at those tasks and how they are prioritized. And then going through the sprints, and these sprints there, you see it's one to four weeks. It means it's very flexible. It's dependent on you as a team and what works with you and your capabilities. And you go all through that things. You've got retrospectives and you've got the review. So how did this help us do what we are doing now to help our son? who by the way now even managed to start running and play soccer today when we were told that he was never going to sit. We started by putting a team together. It wasn't an easy task. And this is what I want to encourage all the parents out there raising kids with special needs, that you need a self-driven team, a self-organizing team. And this team is a team of therapists. So you have to get help around to understand for us, we, we got a physiotherapist, we got a neonatal therapist, we got an occupational therapist, we got a speech therapist, we also got a hydro uh, therapist. And in the latter days of our journey with our son, we managed to get a 
neuromovement therapist, and we had to fly out of Zambia to access those services. What was very common, you know, on this was that I needed to trust the speciality of these team members. I needed to trust them with what they were bringing to the table. And I had to make sure that at every given moment, we were working on a limited number of tasks, which is synonymous to you know, the, the product backlog. At some point, we had to stimulate his neck for it to be strong. And what I want to share with you is that the whole idea is for you to concentrate on little daily sprints rather than wanting to achieve everything or start working on something to support your child until you reach the end, maybe after three years, only to realize that you didn't train him properly or you did not give the right tools to facilitate for his flourishing. And this is where the agile principle comes in because when you work in daily sprint, you allow yourself to fail early and pick up so quickly and learn from those little mistakes that you're making. And that gives a lot of room to your, to your child or to, to a child that you're raising to improve because we discovered that children who end up maybe walking, you know, as though they are disabled, it's not that they were born really disabled, it's because they learned wrong patterns or they learned wrong things. They were not ready for them to, to actually do that. And this is something that has been very critical to us. We always look out for the capabilities that Lubuto has. Lubuto is the name of our son. What are the capabilities that he has right now? Rather than shoving things on him for him to do something because society is pushing us to make him walk. They, they ask questions, is he walking now? Is he running now? But as an agile parent or having an agile mindset, you want to look at the capability because it's all about him. It's, it's the responsiveness. Just the same way that we work with uh, the, the way we limit the work in progress on an on our agile teams because we want to make sure that the velocity of the team you know, is efficient. It's the same way that we apply to our son as well. We make sure that we notice what he's doing right now. If his capability is now, he's, been, he's able to move a little bit of hands, then we incorporate a lot of activities that deal with the hands. So we stimulate more of him doing the hands. So what we are doing now is we are working around his strengths and providing all the positive tools around him to make him do the things. And this is something that has really worked uh, very much for us. And so in building the Agile team, as you see the slide there, I've already talked about it. We had a team of therapists. We still have a team of therapists who are able to bring something to the table. The close family members, because when you are dealing with such things, you only meet therapists for a short period of time, maybe for one hour, and you, you pay a lot of money for that. But for the rest of the hours, you spend with the child. So the agile mindset has to be inculcated in the family members around, and you have to teach them. You have to tell them what it, what it means. And in telling them the many things that you incorporate now, like the Kanban board. In our house, when you come, you will laugh. The living room is full of posters everywhere because Every person who comes in, who walks in, needs to get their information faster. And this is another principle of Agile that we've incorporated in our Agile parenting. So the 40 training chart is right in the face of everybody. Once it goes, somebody has to take. So they don't have to wait for myself or my wife to be around. Everybody is in need and they understand what they're doing. The helpers that we have also understand the things that we are doing. And then I just want to talk about the type of leadership that we've incorporated on this journey. So re resilient leadership and servant leadership is what we've incorporated. Resilient in the sense that you will always fail. That is the truth. On this journey, we've learned that failure is a recipe for success. We failed so many times, I can't even remember. We try something and it just doesn't work out. And sometimes, the boy would just maybe you know, get frustrated and try maybe to walk the time when he was trying to walk, he would stand up, fell, fell down, stand up, fell down, but we never give up. We are resilient and we always look out for what it is that excites him at every stage. So we work around play, as I said before. 
And servant leadership applies more to the team members because you are dealing with different specialists and they come with specialism and you need to respect that. As a servant leader, you want to facilitate more than direct. Instead of telling the therapist to say, you should do this, you should do that. You want to actually engage into a conversation to say, in the last one week, we've noticed that he's trying to kick his feet. What is it that we can do to leverage that milestone that week? And you see, they begin to bring out a lot of ideas. And this is what we've noticed that if you create a stage for specialists to actually perform their creativity and bring their innovation, you attend a lot of milestones. You attend a lot of milestones because they feel free and they feel a part of the team. They don't feel like it's a transaction where you are paying them and you need to direct them or tell them what to do. So exactly the same way that it is uh, on an agile team where you trust your members to make decisions and you, your role as a leader is to create an enabling environment, a positive environment within which they can experiment and feel better. That's exactly what we do on our journey with our son. And this is something that I just want to share with all the parents or the specialists out there to say, you need to trust your team members. You need to allow your team members to experiment. Do not be too careful because you will not attain innovation. Innovation only comes out of failure. This is something that I have learned from my experience with our son. So I've already talked about some of the practices that we've engaged on. Number one, connecting with your son, your daughter, and not fixing. We have three types of models that I've observed in our society. From a medical perspective, medical practitioners want to fix the problem. When they see a child with neurological disorder, they want to fix the problem. And that's why we get on medication and do all those things. And for society, they want to pity. Oh no, oh poor boy, oh poor girl, how is he doing? Is he in pain? You know, they want to pity with you. This is the model that is there. But the model that I've noticed works to enable your child do more and respond more is you connecting with them. Genuine connection with them will allow you to realize the potential that they have and you to understand that it's not in your power to fix them. It's in your power to create an environment around them where they learn to fix themselves. Because it's when they build neuropaths that they never forget. For example, when you're doing physiotherapy, you know, you, you keep pulling a child's leg because you want to, to create strength in their leg. What you do there is you give them muscle memory and that's what happens, it ends there. But if you connect with them, you realize that maybe they love the song, the wheels on the bus. So when you're singing the wheels on the bus, go round and round, and then you're doing your hands like this, and then they also sing along and they begin to do the hands round and round. At the back of your mind, you know that what you're trying to achieve is to enable them to move hands like this, but then they are carried away by the song. In the subconscious, they begin to fire neuropaths that teach them to move hands like that. You know, children on the bus go up and down, you lift the legs up, you bring it down. So there's something attached to the process and they don't understand the process that's going on because they love the song so much and they are playing along and they lift their, head, their, their legs. When you do it repetitively in your next sprint, you realize that you will now just have to sing the song. They'll remember that they will have to lift their legs by themselves and then put them down. What you did there, you did not fix them, but you created an environment where they now develop themselves. Should you not be there, they will remember how to make that movement. So this is something that I learned very interestingly. And the second one is the osmotic communication. Under osmotic communication, this is where we, we brought specialists in, into one room every now and then. We would have uh, an occupational uh, therapist and the physiotherapist together in the same room. And they begin to work with our child. And as the occupational therapist was working on our child, you would notice that the physiotherapist could then now pick certain skills from the occupational therapist without them having to sit on a table and being taught on how to do certain things. And this is something that really worked for us. And every now and then I would carry our helpers with us to the, to the therapy center. I never allow my son to go on his own to the therapy center. We would go all of us because I needed them to get 
the information osmotically. They will remember to say, oh, the therapist did this. She said, you shouldn't put him in a W sitting. It's not a good thing. So they begin to do those things without even being taught. This is how important osmotic communication is in agile uh, practice, but it has worked very well in our, in our way of living. You want to do that. You always want to bring people together. That's the reason why we created a WhatsApp group for faster communicated, communication with change, exchange updates and everything. So like that, you build your teams, which feeds into the next point where we talk about generalization rather than specialization. Many people want to limit specialists to one thing, but you actually endanger yourself by not getting the other talents that people have within themselves. So you want to just give them a platform and wait for them to be as creative as they can be. You'll be amazed how a speech therapist can give you guidelines on how you can incorporate occupational therapist activities such as using different textures and how they can be related to communication, you know. But this person is a speech pathologist, but because you've given them a platform for them to actually be general and bring different ideas to the table, you cultivate the mindset of creativity. So this has been amazing and I encourage all the parents out there to embrace this. You want to be general rather than specialize. Then embracing failure, I've already talked about this. You will fail and this is, this is guaranteed. You will fail, it's not easy. The journey is uphill, but you should not falter once you fail. You should always remember that in Agile, failure is embraced because it's part of the process. It's part of the success story that comes along with it. There's never any innovation story. There's never any creativity, creativity story that has come without failure. Because if you are so scared of failure, you begin to do the same things that you know every day and you will never get to learn anything. And when you're dealing with a situation like raising a child with special needs, you are brainstorming. There's many studies out, out there that actually ha are not yet approved. But for you to actually break through and come up with new innovations, look at us today. I'm talking about agile parenting, something that hasn't been there. It's simply because I broke the comfort zone and just, I just say, let me grab this, let me grab this, let me tell her into our situation and let's it see how we do it. So by this is what has happened yeah. to us. Yeah. And finally, I want to talk about little daily steps. I want to tell you that there is power in taking little steps. And usually these steps, as I said, even in my TED talk, they are far from excellent themselves. But then when you put them together over time, when you close your sprint, if your sprint is one week or two weeks, you'll be amazed at how much you will have achieved because you're so engrossed in the daily activities. And these daily activities give you an opportunity to fail small because there are small activities that you're taking on. When you fail, the impact is not very bad. You can always pick up and work on them. And the learning process is gradual. So the trajectory is always going up. So this is what I want to share with all the parents raising their kids. And I want to encourage you to celebrate these little victories because they mean a lot. And I understand babies are on different spectrums. Some of them are very severe that they can't even move. Some of them are just mild where they can even raise to a level where our son has been reason to actually even play soccer. But I want to advise you something. Do not be engrossed in the idea of wanting your child to run all of a sudden. You should contextualize it. If your child just sleeps, should they move a finger? That is a big milestone. You want to celebrate that. Do not dwell on the things they can't do. You want to work on their capabilities. So I want you to remember this in the closing on, of, of this. That's the agile mindset. You want to capitalize on the little things that they can do with the finger. If the finger begins to move, can you communicate with the finger? If maybe they tap it twice, maybe they want water. They tap it three times, maybe they want to go to the toilet. So you want to really study and pay attention. You need to listen more as a parent than you using the pressures coming out of the society to just want them to sit. You know, you force them to get in a wheelchair or you force them in a walker. You really want to listen to them and then respond by creating an enabling environment. So 
thank you so much. I will end here. I promise to not take much of the time. I will stop the sharing and I'll roll back the ball to Nchimunya for us to get into a conversation. Thank you. You know, Billy, every time we have uh, this conversation, it's a very um, heartwarming conversation because the way you have embraced your uh, sense of um, uh, well being, it's not an easy task. But the beauty about how you have done uh, all of this journey, the way you have, um, you're carrying this journey with you is that you have embraced um, agility into your, into, your, into your personal life, into your children's lives, into your, the people that are around you. And the thing that really is um, very important to me is that the values that you have use the agile values that you have brought into your family. I think um, the biggest thing is about being open, sharing um, what you're going through, sharing what is happening, um, all, the, all the therapies that are going on with your child with the other team members, which, are, which can be family members, which um, the team members can be external from your family. So it's, I believe it's very important to be open to be respectful, and and I think respect is, is is a big thing because you need to respect the people that you're dealing with, and they also need to respect you in turn, because the journey is ongoing, and and you have to share that mutual respect. And the other thing that really um, came to my mind is um, discipline. How how have you used discipline in in, in your journey? I, I believe. When you're focused, um, that is a very powerful thing. So focus actually requires discipline. How have you used uh, discipline in your journey as well? Billy, can you hear me? Yes, and when I come again? I was saying, how have you used um, discipline in your journey to raise up uh, Lubuto? Okay, thank you very much. So we've incorporated discipline at different levels. At a personal level, as a leader, I, I take myself to be a leader on this team, a seven leader on this team. The discipline of us adhering to the roadmap that we put out there for ourselves is very critical. In as much as Agile is an adaptive process where we expect change to happen every now and then. We want to have a roadmap. What is a one to three months roadmap for this period of time? And we want to be disciplined to stick to what is in that roadmap. So once we say we would want to activate or stimulate his leg, we want to focus on the leg. What the occupational authorities does what the speech therapist does incorporates the leg work as well. So that brings in an aspect of discipline, adhering to what we agree as a team that we are going to work on this because inconsistencies will send wrong signals to the child and you confuse the child, there's no consistency and they will not know what is really going on. But if you're consistent, you, you stay disciplined as a team to adhere to the roadmap that you've put, then you begin to work on that. That does not mean that should you find things change along the way, then you just stick to the roadmap. No, discipline again is adhering to the agile values still. We've had uh, situations where we tried to make him walk. We bought a walker for him, but he didn't know how to walk at that time. And so we noticed that he was cringing and moving like that. And in the process, he started picking up bad habits. You know, cringing is just a habit that you pick. It's just think about it. You and I, when we are, when we are put on slippery grounds, you will cringe because you're not aware, you, you're, not, you're not used to the slippery ground or watery, watery ground. And so you cringe. Now, imagine you doing that repetitively. If your sprint is maybe one month, you're doing that. So you learn to do it with your hands like this. And what happens after that, you think that's the right way of walking. So you begin, we begin to walk like this. 
It's not that you were supposed to be walking like this. That's just that you were forced to do it when you were not ready. So discipline has applied at many levels. The other discipline is on our son alone. We don't pity our son. If our son calls for help and we feel like he doesn't really need help, we don't give him the help. We wait for him to push himself because we want to build that agility mindset in him as well, which we've achieved so far. And he goes on to do it. And he learns to say, I will not be given things on a silver plate. I need to incorporate myself and I need to push myself. And this has really worked well for us. So those are just a few points that I can share with you where we have applied discipline on our team. Thank you. So during, during, um, during the journey, um, Billy, are there things that you anticipated and then uh, they took a different twist, they changed and you had to adapt to the change? A lot, that's, that's our, daily, our daily encounter. We, we always anticipate for good things to happen. The example that I'll give you is for drilling. We were told once his brain matures, he will then reduce on the drilling because drilling is attributed to him learning. So when he's learning the same way that happens to us, when you're so carried away by something and you, you, know, you, you drew a bit, it's because your mind just got away from you for a moment. And this happens for children. But this has never stopped. To this day, we're having this conversation, is still drilling. And we keep looking for new innovative ways of helping him out. And the other thing is the potty training. We tried to potty train him when he was younger. And because that process was so repetitive, we were asked to be taking him in, in time intervals. And he ended up resenting that process. So when you take him on the toilet pan, he thinks I need to say done for me to just get out of this. So that's what he does. When you put him there, he just says done. He does not connect to it, you know, to doing what it is supposed to do when, you know, on potty training. So we've actually had to postpone that. We just say we need to find new ways of doing it. So as I say, failure is part of our journey, but it's a strength. We get to learn from there and try to adapt by using other innovative ways to, you know, just make the situation better. It's, it's, um, it's amazing to see how um, your child has also started adapting and growing out of the habits that could have um, deterred him from the progress that he's, he's making. And uh, I'd, I'd like to say it's, 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 it's amazing that he's getting those strides and moving forward and making progress um, with the different activities that he needs to do. Are there any um, goals that you set for your family and for your son as well? Um, in terms oh, of- Oh, thanks. Right. The goals, the goals that we set are actually the goals that we put together with the entire team. When I talked about those information radiators, sticking things on the fridge, sticking things on the walls, we, we, we put it very clear to everyone to say, our goal this time is to encourage him to open and close the knees. Because remember when he learned how to walk, he started walking on stiff legs and that now became a habit. It was difficult to break. And how, how do we break this? And we are very thankful that we, we had our second born daughter who's actually more of a leader on the team than all of us. And this is one thing that I want to share with all the people on this team. It could be in your workplaces, you know, it could be in your personal lives, it could be anywhere. You, you should never look down on any team member because, you know, when our daughter came on board, she, she was just a young little girl. You know, we knew it all. We knew what we were doing as agile parents, as certified project managers, you know. But what happened was our daughter started relating with our son at the same level and our son started getting uh you know challenged by the sister and so he started mimicking the sister more than he was actually responding from us uh parents and and, and the therapist and so what we did was we started now incorporating uh goals 
within play with the sister. So we'll do something where the sister does something, then we give to him. He will do exactly what the sister uh, did. Right now, he's now vocalizing very clearly because the sister does that. So the sister will go on TV, they, they start singing the, the Teletubbies song or Twelly Who's, and then you begin to see him voice out. You actually hear the words very clearly. And then you're wondering, when did this happen? You know, thank, good, th th thank goodness to the sister. And so this is what I want to share with all of you that every team member matters. You talked about respect. You want to respect every team member. Do not look down because they have, you know, small qualifications. They might be bringing a certain gift to the table. You want to, to be observant as a leader and then incorporate the goals within what you have. So this is something that we've kept doing. We keep changing goals to incorporate our capabilities. Yeah. That's, that's very encouraging. And um, we, we all set goals uh, for the team, for organizations, for um, personal use. But when it comes to personal, uh, personal agility, um, those you need to adapt to um, certain way of doing things in order to, in an intentional manner. So I'm happy you have those, um, intentional uh, moves where you have, uh, you, when your child calls for something and you as a parent, you have that instinct to say, this call is not what it is. And you, you're you able to leave him to do things on his own. I think that has, that has been um, a key thing to build him to the level that he's gotten to. And um, as a team, whether it's family members or external team members, what are the roles that each one of you play? Do you have like, daddy can only do, if daddy is not here, only daddy can do this, or do you teach everybody else what you can do and, uh, and so forth? It's teaching everybody else what I can do, what the physiotherapist can do, what the occupational therapist can do at any given time, because we are not always there around him. And hence this idea of incorporating them into the process. When we go for a therapy, we, we will take maybe one, one, one helper along to be in the, in the therapy session. And when I come back home, I'm playing with them. I'll actually be talking loud to say, when he does this, you want to do this because you're encouraging him to do this. And this is something that communication should be very effective. Do not just tell people to say, don't do this with them. Don't do that with them. It has to make sense because remember the osmotic communication is about exchanging skills. You want the other person to uphold the skill when you are not around. And this is something that we have done very well. When he begins to cry, if I'm not around, there have been times when grandmother comes through and you know how grandmas love to spoil the grandchildren. But in this case, I'm about to sit down and have a very tough conversation with my mom to say, look, this is a different situation. This is what we are doing with him because of this, this, and that. And then she says, oh, okay, I understand. When he cries, you don't want to just give him. You want to tell him, use your words, because this is a prompt uh, command that we use with them. If he begins to cry, you say, use your word. Then he just says, water, you know, because he wants water. But if you allow him to cry and cry, then you are reinforcing the crying. It will stick in his neural path that crying is a way of communication, but he's not at the stage where he's supposed to cry when communicating. So in answering your question, skills have been flattered. I had an opportunity to go to South Africa with them to go through the process of neuro movement therapy. I had to study that. I was with him in the oxygen chamber. When I came back, I had to sit down with all the therapists and share the notes with them. I actually did a little pamphlet, which I shared with them because we needed that skill to be inculcated in everyone because these specialists are actually not only seeing our son, but they're seeing other children as well. So you would want them to apply that on other children for them to get better. So this is how we've worked about it. It's generalization from A to Z. It's interesting. I, I always, um, every time I'm asked to, to give um, 
an explanation of what um, Agile is, I always say you do a little and learn a little. And from your um, analogy and explanation of um, your journey, Billy, it's, it's evident enough that from the little steps that you've been uh, implementing, you've, you've learned quite a bit and you also learn, um, you also manage risk quite early. So I'm happy you, you, you have this agile journey with your family. And if we have, I think we're going to go to uh, questions from, from the audience. If you have any questions for Billy, please, this is a time to ask. And if you have any, any uh, contributions to make as well, those are welcome. So any questions from the audience and contributions, please. Um, I see from the chat, um, we have um, values and principles over frameworks or practices. So I think Billy had explained earlier on that the values that they have um, implemented on their journey as a family at, or as agile parents to a disabled child, they have incorporated uh, values like respect, openness, which um, is very key. They've shared all the information with the with the team members, as he explained earlier on. Um, they are also focused on certain goals. They have to achieve those goals. Um, they set the goals um, in their journey as well. And um, you can also look at the the discipline they have. They were told that um, the child will will not get to a point where the child will will, will walk but they have instilled discipline in themselves. They have instilled, as parents, they have instilled discipline in the, in the other team members and they've, they're, they've achieved great results. And um, it, it's a very recommendable uh, thing that Billy, you and your family are doing to implement, to bring that agility into your family. And not only um, the, the, the situation is a very uh, peculiar situation, but you have embraced it with grace you have shared your story. People have learned from your story. And this is where we are. Agility is, 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 is a great thing. It works in different fields. And here we are talking about um, agility in a family and in parenting and pa not only just normal parenting, parenting um, to, to a special needs child. So I, I really uh, commend your family for doing that and for sharing your story, Billy. It's, it's a very interesting story and um, I'm so happy you came. So um, you any, um, any other questions from the audience? I see, good job, Billy, very inspiring. Um, agree, incentive, um, the practices of value. And I think for now that's, that's it. Maybe somebody wants to make a contribution. It'll be great to get contributions. This right. is a, a point of learning for me as well. As I told you, it's a, it's, it's a learning curve for us. I would like to hear from other people and maybe just get to see how we could incorporate more of right. the values, other values and principles. I, I would really like to hear from other people. Even just a feedback is, is good. I have a question actually. I, I I don't have kids, but I was always wondering if you the people who have kids uh, whether or not you 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 succeeded in introducing some agile practices with with your kids. Do you see any parallels between <laughs> dealing with your kids and dealing with colleagues at work? <laughs> that is that is an interesting one. That is an interesting one. I I never saw that coming. <laughs> but the similarities are always there. The one similarity that I'll give to you is at your workplace, when you're dealing with your coworker or maybe you're a supervisor in that arrangement, if, if you're raising a child, and this is something that I've uh, reiterated at every given time, you want to always make sure that you, you are creating an enabling environment, a positive, and safe environment for your child 
to grow. It's not for you to really mold your child to say, do this, do that. Children actually shape their own future. They know what to do. Nobody teaches a, a child how to suck. Have you ever wondered? They just learn how to suck by themselves. We never get to them to teach them how to suck. When they want to start crawling, they do it themselves. And so you realize that our role as parents is to be very attentive, to be very great observers and listeners, and just create enabling environment. That's the reason why we buy walkers when we see our child trying to walk using chairs and everything around them. So now you know, okay, he's or she's at this stage, I can buy a walker for them. You, you enable that, that, that activity for them to get better at it. If they later on begin to sing, you, you know that they have a gift of singing, then you, you buy a piano for them. This is exactly what happens in our lives, you know, our friends, our, our workplace. You want to be very observant with your juniors or your peers with the gifts that they have. What capabilities do they have? And as a leader, you don't want to be a type of a leader who just shoves work into you know, your workmate or your junior to say, I want this report by this time. Does that person even know how to use Excel? That's the first question. You, know, you want to know that they have an enabled environment, they have the right tools around them for them to do the work such that when you tell them to say, give me this report by the end of this week, you are sure that they have that. And then you build the trust. There has to be trust in that self environment where your junior or your coworker should tell you to say, um, uh, Sankt Pao, I don't know if I pronounced that word properly, I don't know how to do this. Could you help me? You know, you, you want to have that kind of environment. You don't want an environment where people keep to themselves. So this is the correlation that I would pick in raising a child and a workplace. I think also just to add, uh, Billy, when, when it comes to workplaces and um, being in an agile environment, um, I, have, I have learned to use agile principles and pillars in my own personal life with my children. For instance, uh, I think Billy had, had um, said it earlier on, when, when, when a child is looking for something and you're trying to move from a, a different level, you're trying to help that child move from a different stage to the next stage. Sometimes by you helping the child to do what they're doing, then you're deterring the process. Let the child figure out things on their own. And um, it applies to, to being in the office. If you're in, in an agile environment, if you're the scrum master, how do you help your team to be self-organizing and to be able to to do things on their own and, and achieve uh, value. So it, it applies um, with, with kids at, uh, as well. So if you see a child has, is trying to, let's say, uh, move from a level of uh, not walking or crawling into, into walking, let them, let them get up on their own and try to walk. Don't always be there to help, to give a hand. And the other thing is, um, I think the key thing that Billy's family has used is uh, being transparent about what they do and um, inspecting and adapting the process. So they have inspected their process. They, have, they are transparent about what they're doing and they have adapted to the situation. It's the same, you can apply those principles in the office as well. Be transparent in what you do. Inspect the process, inspect the, the methods that you're doing, inspect the frameworks. And I would like to say, not everything, um, not one size fits all. So whatever fits for your organization, whatever fits for your team, go ahead and use that. So even with families, with kids, it's, if, I, if I see that my kid, um, um, for instance, my daughter's uh, kid can play eight musical instruments. And then I, I want to push my daughter to play eight musical instruments. That, that's not how things work. I will let my child do what she's capable of doing and help her um, exhibit herself in, in what she's capable of doing. So all those principles can be applied to your personal life, personal agility, to your workplace, business agility, and so forth. So it's not like we are strict 
only this framework will work here and only that framework will, will work there. So whatever works for you, use that, use, use that, but you have to follow the values and principles that guide us in being agile. I see there's a hand from Suvilo. Yeah. Uh Oops, I think I muted you. Am I muted or am I not muted? I was mute, I muted you. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, so I was saying, um, even though it hasn't been explicitly said, there is a level of emotional intelligence that you need to have when we are dealing with your teams or your children. You need to have a higher level of emotional intelligence and enable their own emotional intelligence to grow. Um, that means at times you need to allow them to fail so they know how to deal with that. What is important is not that they failed, but what is important is they learned from that failure and adapted rather than regress. And it's pretty much the same with teams. The, you, sometimes you have to let them fail because that's the only way that they're going to learn. But then how are you enabling them to recover from that? And when and are they recovering? Are they identifying ways in which they can lift themselves up and go on? Because at the end of the day, um, even if you are working with team or you're with your, your, your children, right? Um, you won't always be there. You cannot always be with somebody 24 seven. What is important is equipping them with the skills that they require so that when you're not there, they can still go on. So it's it's so nice to, to see the courage that has been, um, that uh, Billy and his family um, have shown, you know, the, the courage to try something. I, my question actually was going to be, um, how did you decide to apply, you know, agile values to this? Um, and, you know, the courage to try something new in an uncertain circumstance, in a circumstance that would frustrate you, depress you, um, but as well as the courage to share your experience. It's really, it's really um, awesome to see. But yeah, back to my question, like, how did you choose to go agile? I wish, I wish you didn't even ask that question because I, I was enjoying everything that she was saying. Thank you very much, Sue. I 100% I agree with you. A level of emotional intelligence is very important and we need to qualify actually in my next slides it should not be embrace failure it should be embrace creative failure so it's failure emanating from creative activities so a team member or a team should be working at something creative and then they fail not just failing because you know they're not doing so much thank you so much how did i think about embracing these agile principles, I'll be very honest with you. It's an issue of desperate situation calling for desperate measures. And I always believe that we don't go to school, we don't go through the process of education for us to accumulate papers. It's for us to actually implement them, affect them in our day-to-day -day lives. Somebody in the chat just posted to say, before we are scrum masters and everything, we are human beings. Meaning whatever we accrue now as scrum masters, whatever we call ourselves, it's just an embellishment to what we already do as human beings. So we should be able to apply those principles. And this is one of my principles uh, that, that I apply. So if I'm a computer scientist, so computer, computer science was my, is, is my foundation um, bachelor's degree. And I did a lot of programming for 15 years. And so studying patterns and everything, responses is something that was inculcated in me because of programming. And so when this situation happened to me, I now started thinking, should I build a robot that can stimulate him to do the movement? And I started thinking mechanically like that until I tried now to marry the agile principle because I looked at the process, what was happening. Our son would be doing something today. The following day, he changes. So I was always... Uh, changing capability in him. And when I learned about Agile, you know, it suited the situation that we were going through. So for me, I ran to the knowledge that I already had and I bought a lot of other books to accumulate information and just knowledge for us to manage the, the process better. So this is how I came to put the computer science and the project management uh, Agile principles together to come up with what we are doing. Coming to having the courage to tell the story, I will tell you one thing. 
in, in, in conclusion in answering your question is that it's when I realized that our stories are not really ours, if you come to think of it. It's just like any other thing that was created was never created for itself. Not a pressing iron, not this laptop. The laptop will never serve itself. It's saving us right now. Even us as human beings, we were born with a purpose to serve other people. And it's the same with our own stories. Our own stories we will never change us that much, but they will change the next person listening to us. So it's selfish to keep a story. This is a conviction that I had, that my wife and I had. And so we just decided to say, let's tell this story. They sh they, there must be many other parents going through the same difficulties of finding uh, therapists and, and methodologies to use. They're just confused as much as we were. Why don't we give them a head first by telling them the challenges we went through so that they can circumvent them quickly and even make this process better for the rest of the parents. So that's that's why we decided to share. Thank you very much, Sue. And I think just to add, Billy, looking at the value that you have gotten out of the process, it's it's interesting to see um, the, the outcome of the whole process because when, when, when the child was born, you were told he would not be able to do this, this and this. But through the little iterative process that you were doing, you kept on being persistent, you repeated the process, you were, mm -hmm. you were focused, you had a goal to achieve. And at the end of the day, this is the value that you're getting by following what you laid down as your goal. This is what you want to achieve. You followed that through. So mm -hmm. I think it, it may not work for other people because there's so many aspects that um, are incorporated. But looking at Billy's family, this has worked because they have been following the values, they have been following the principles. And the fact that Billy is, um, Billy and his wife, I think I read your wife is also into project management. Billy and his wife have the knowledge. Somebody shared that knowledge with them. They, 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 they knew, they know what to do and what not to do. They, there are anti patterns that we have in, in, in being agile. So they know exactly what to do to that situation. So that has helped them and they have gained value out of it. So it may work for, it has worked for Billy. And that's why we're sitting here today to talk about it. And it may not work for another family, but people have to try, they have to try things that work for them and depending on the situation also. True, and, and I agree with you. you. You need to tell her these values. It's not all the set of values that will apply. It's not all the 12 principles of Agile that will apply. You right. really have to look at your situation, contextualize what is it that can work in that situation. And that actually gives you more value out of applying these principles. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions? Any other additions? I have a, an addition. It's not a question. It's not an addition. It's right. a, um, a proposal. What right. about, um, maybe I can even do the work. I rewatched the video and I put the elements that were discussed here in a Jamboard, just write them on cards and put it in open access to all of you, just to kind of create some kind of body of knowledge, even if it's used one time, it will be used, useful at least for me. And who knows, maybe this can grow into something that people can reuse or it can grow some more um, let's say not formal, but more um, structured knowledge right. um, about, I mean, knowledge, knowledge is a big word, but what I mean is experience about. Right. And, and, and Maru, that's why we're here. We're here to share. It's, it's, it's through these experiences, through this uh, process of uh, empiricism. That's why Billy is sitting here and telling us of what he's, he's done. So let's keep knowledge sharing and, uh, you never know what comes out. A lot of collaborations, and uh, Billy, you might, you might, you might, you might be doing something with with Maru. So yeah, let's yes. get started. I'm very excited, and this is one thing that I'll share with the rest of you. Uh, telling this story has really opened the doors, you know, for the bigger purpose. After the TED talk, I've had to meet great people like Maru, who just you know, offer the services by themselves to say, why don't we turn this into this? And really for me, as I say, it's not our story. 
is for this knowledge to go out there for many parents to actually read those placards that Mari is going to work on and to share them with the rest of the world so that we make this world a better place. You know, we, we, we were not born on this earth to just leave it the way we found it. We were born to make it better than we found it. And it's you and I who are supposed to apply our gifts and talents and the knowledge that we've acquired. And in this moment, the agile principles and everything that it can do to the world, I think that's what we need to be doing more as humanity. Thank you so much, Maru. Uh, since we're doing uh, kudos, uh, thanks to Satpal. He's the one who started this whole thing a year ago. And uh, <laughs> thanks to Billy for exchanging it. And, and yeah, I'll put it in the jump board. I mean, it will cost me maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And I'll open oh. it to all of you guys and see where it goes from there. Why not? Right. So thanks, for the, thanks for the show. Uh, oh, sorry now, Virginia. Um, thanks for the show. It, it really wasn't me. There was lots of people involved. I was just one person. This is a truly global effort with people coming together from across the world to make this happen. So, so many people have done this. But no, brilliant talk, guys. Loved it. It was really powerful. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Seth. Thank you so much. Thanks. And um, Billy, maybe you can share your, your details in the chat. If people still want to get a hold of Billy, he'll share his details and uh, you can connect. If there's any questions that were not answered, um, feel free to reach out to Billy or to myself and we'll be gladly, um, we'll be glad to answer those questions. So please go ahead and click on that link and we can share. Um, I've also shared my, my details. So please go ahead and um, get the details and we can, we can connect. Thank you so much for coming and uh, it was lovely hosting you. And there's so many activities that are still going on with the Agile Training Reflect Festival. So please visit, um, the calendar, depending on your time, go ahead and attend those um, lovely, lovely events and uh, continue sharing knowledge. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, the rest of the weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Take